God we gather to worship, whether we're online or on campus, we're together with one heart, and the God we gather to worship is a God who has power to transform. We can at times feel like we're stuck. This will never change. I, I can't get out of this situation. I, I can't change this thing about me. And, 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 and maybe we can't get out of the situation. Maybe we can't change it, but God can. He is powerful, he is glorious, and he is present. And we're, we're talking about what it, what it looks like, what it means to actually live the dream life. Living the dream. What does that look like? And, and we, what comes to our minds very quickly is, you know, I, I want plenty of money. That's the dream life. Or I, I want comfort. Or I want experiences. I want to taste good foods and travel interesting places. Then, then I'm, I'm getting the, the dream life. I want the health that I want to have or just a, a good cup of coffee or a quiet moment. Whatever it is that we imagine to be the dream life. What we're learning from Ephesians chapter 4 and 5 is that there's more to it. It's more than just enjoying the things of this life. There's something bigger. There, there's this, really the dream life is about walking through a process of transformation from who we are and where we've been and how we've seen the world and how we've thought and, 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 and seeing that God's presence through Jesus Christ can transform us and make us some, someone new, someone different. The, the very thing that we long for and dream for but we can't imagine we could get there, God wants to bring into us. And, and so three weeks ago, Pastor Sean kicked off this series and he shared in his introduction, uh, he said one of his favorite Bible passages was John 10.10. 10. And this is probably not his favorite part. The beginning of the verse says this. The thief, meaning the devil, the enemy of your soul, the thief comes only to steal, kill, and destroy. That would be a strange favorite verse, right? The thief comes only to steal, kill, and destroy. But Jesus goes on to say this. I have come that you may have life and have it to the full. Someone say Amen. That's the heart, that's the desire of Jesus. That you would experience the dream life, to experience life and experience it to the full. And so in Ephesians chapter four and five, after the apostle Paul, writing to this real church in this real place called Ephesus, these real people, he's, he's given them some core beliefs about their theology, the church, what they should understand and believe. He starts to get into how we can live our lives if we build our lives on, on Christ, on the things of Christ. And what he really says is, you can now enter a journey of changing kind of, kind of out with these old things, these old attitudes, these old behaviors, these things that were part of your life that seemed so natural and even sometimes fun or interesting, out with those things get set aside and you begin to walk into new things. Now, not everything that was there before is all bad. It doesn't have to all go, but there are certain things that, that were, became part of us that need to be left behind. And so in Ephesians 4, 22 through 24, I'm going to read these. They won't be on your screen online or on campus. Just listen to these words. And then we're going to turn to Ephesians 4 and study it together. So if you have a Bible or a, a Bible app, you can go to Ephesians chapter 4. But just listen to these words. It says, you were taught with regard to your former way of life, how things were before, to put off your old self, out with the old, put those things off, which is being corrupted by its deceitful desires. And to be made new in the attitude of your minds, a new way of thinking. And to put on a new self created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. You can be transformed and become more than you ever imagined or dreamed through the power of Jesus. There's this journey of kind of out with the old and in with the new. And this is really the journey of following Jesus. It's a lifelong journey of walking with Jesus through this world as you're becoming more and more like him when you put your faith in him. And so Pastor Sean talked a few weeks ago about how we should be out with our certain words, out with lies and false speech, and in with the truth. When you begin to walk in truth and speak the truth, you begin to walk in the dream life. We talked a couple weeks ago about out with anger. Not, not that anger itself isn't sin, but when anger simmers in our soul, it kind of erupts and blows up, and we do things we shouldn't do and say things we shouldn't say, and out with the results of anger, and then in with peace. Deal with those things so you can walk in the peace of Jesus, who is the Prince of Peace. That's the transformation that Jesus is working in our lives. We talked about out with dishonesty and laziness and in with hard work and generosity. That a thief can become someone who's generous to those in need. Who can make that kind of transformation? Only the power of Jesus in us. Out with the old and in with the new. Today we're going to talk about another part of this Ephesians 4 into Ephesians 5 passage that says, out with bitterness. Out with bitterness and in with compassion and kindness and a gentle heart. Out with a bitterness that begins to just eat away at our soul. 
where something happens in our lives or somebody says something or does something or we experience something that, that we get so angry, you get so bitter, it just sort of, sort of marinades in our soul and slowly it corrupts us from the inside out. Uh, like, like a tree that you look at in this forest of trees, this tree that looks beautiful and healthy and strong and then a storm comes and the winds blow and all of a sudden that tree just snaps and topples over. And you look inside and you recognize, oh, it was rotten on the inside. There was a reason that tree snapped and all the trees around it didn't. The other ones were healthy on the inside. Our lives can look like that sometimes. When bitterness gets in our soul, and man, we're just, we're just, we just let it stir around. It begins to kind of rot our inner life. And at some point, things snap. Things go wrong because we haven't addressed it and dealt with it. And so we're going to look today at God's word and we're going to see this idea of out with bitterness, leaving that behind. Don't let it eat away at your soul and rot your soul, but in with, in with compassion and love and forgiveness and kindness, the things that reflect the presence of Jesus. So as I read Ephesians chapter 4, beginning in verse 29, Ephesians 4, 29 through 5, 2, I want you just to listen and look for that transformation that happens, that out with the old and in with the new. And then when it comes to our souls, our lives, our words, and all that kind of comes out of us. Ephesians 4, 29. Do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths. Leave that behind. But only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs. That it may benefit those who listen. Because, you know, our words reflect what's in our heart. They do. Our words reflect what's in the inside. Verse 30. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God with whom you have been sealed for the day of redemption. Do you know that our lives can grieve the heart of God, grieve the Spirit of God? And so get rid of, off with, done with it. Get rid of all bitterness, rage, anger, brawling, and slander, along with every form of malice. And then it shifts. But be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as in Christ, God forgave you. That's the model for our forgiveness, is the forgiveness of Jesus. Wow. Just as God forgave you. Follow God's example, therefore, as dearly loved children. And walk in the way of love, just as Christ loved us and gave himself for us as a fragrant offering and sacrifice. Our model of forgiveness, as we walk in this new life, is Jesus. Our model of love is Jesus. That's a big model. That's a big challenge. Lord, this is our prayer today. As we dig into your word, as we reflect on, on the words of Scripture... God, as we reflect on the words that you inspired the Apostle Paul to write over 2,000 years ago uh, to, to ordinary people in a, in a real place in the world, words that can speak to our hearts, to our souls, and teach us. God, we pray we would open our ears to hear, our hearts to receive, and our lives to be transformed. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So the way it was... Without Christ in our lives, and if you're not yet a follower of Jesus, you know, look and say, okay, what could my life look like if, if there really is a God, and if God really came among us, Jesus, God with us, if he died and rose again, he could transform my life. Could I live the dream life? Am I, do I think I'm living the dream life? Is there, is there more to it? Maybe God will give you a vision of more today that will speak to your heart. But the way it was, our words were unwholesome, angry, and unforgiving. I believe without the gentle presence of Jesus transforming us, our words can be unwholesome. They can be angry, unforgiving, sometimes overtly and angrily, sometimes quietly and subtly, but it gets into our souls. When bitterness is there, it, deals with, it, it comes out in many different ways. So look with me at Ephesians 4, 29 to 31. And just think about what this says about our words because our words reflect our heart. If you want to know what's in someone's heart, listen to them for a while. You'll figure out really quickly what's on the heart because what's in the heart comes out through our words and our attitudes. So do not let any unwholesome talk, any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only what is helpful for building others up. Will this help people? Will this build them up? According to their needs, does it fit who they are? And that's a lot of thinking before you talk right there, but that helps, right? That it may benefit those who listen. Will people gain something from what I'm about to say? And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God with whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Get rid of all bitterness, Rage and anger, brawling and slander, along with every form of malice. To, to recognize that, that the words that come out of our mouths can be extremely damaging, very, very dangerous. 
The potential danger of thoughtless words is greater than we recognize. We can use words as our weapons, not just verbally speaking words, but also texting words, emailing words. We live in a time where the potential to be vicious with our words. Someone can, can write something or say something and hit send with a recorded voice file or with written words and send it all over the place and impact people with those words. Words have always been damaging and dangerous if we're not careful, but the ability to spread those words has increased in our world. We have to be more and more careful about what we say, what we write, what we communicate. Our words reflect what's happening inside of us. And so if we find our, our words being jealous or being vengeful or being angry or being bitter, so where's that coming from? Something's happening on the inside. I want to share two stories with you today uh, that, that are sort of defining moments in my life. And one of the stories, I've shared part of it with you, but not a lot of it. I've shared part of the story with you. But uh, one was a, cha- a turning point in my life in fourth grade, in that fourth grade year, and, and the other was a turning point in my life before I became a junior in high school. So in fourth grade, I went to school. Uh, I, I loved kindergarten. I loved first grade. I loved second grade. I ser- I le- my favorite teacher of all was my third grade teacher. It was funny. She was like the sweetest teacher I ever had, and her name was Mrs. Sauer, which was kind of funny to me as a kid. I think, oh, she's so sweet, but she's sour. But, she, but I loved school. I did well in school. Fourth grade came. My fourth grade teacher, I don't know, I, don't, I can't go back and figure, it, figure all out you know, what happened in her life, but she handled the naughty kids in class with words, words that were mean and words that were vicious. And she basically would kind of attack us and try to put us in our place. And I, I was a fourth grader before there was diagnoses like ADD or ADDHD. If they had it, I probably would have gotten ADDHD, HD, HD, HD. Um, I, you know, Dennis, you've traveled with me. You know, I'm, I, I got friends. I'm like this all the time. I'm wound up. I have energy. I don't, I don't do caffeine. What's that? 24 7. My wife would say the same. I don't, I don't, I don't drink caffeine. I'm just. Super high energy from the minute I get up to the minute. And, and by the way, when I'm preaching, this is me talking slow. I'm saying, slow down, Kevin, slow down, Kevin. This is true. It's, and when I get excited, I talk even faster. This is just me, okay? Imagine me in a fourth grade body, in a fourth grade class, right? And so, uh, so my teacher would just take jabs and take jabs and jabs. And it was mostly the boys. The boys were more energetic, and I think, in that, at least in my class. So it was the boys she was trying to put in their place. And so the a turning point in my fourth grade year was a day when I'm sitting in class, and my teacher, I'm not going to say her name, but I remember her name, uh, uh, my teacher said to the class, I want everyone to turn to page such and such in our reading book, because there's, pa- there's a picture of, of Kevin Harney on that page. I'm in fourth grade, so I start turning in my reading book, and some other people turn their fashion, they're laughing, it already started, and I get there, and I open up, there's only one picture on the page, and it's a monkey in a cage. And the whole class laughed. And I, when I realized what was going on, this is actually what I did. I slammed my book shut. I took it. I threw it at her as hard as I could. I ran out the door, ran all the way home, went in my house, said, I'm never going to school again. I'm done. My mom was a teacher in the same school district. She got a call. She drove home. She found me. She said, you're going back to school. I said, no, I'm not. I'm never going back to school. Fourth grade. I was done. She said, you're going to go back to school. She took me back to school, dropped me off. She met with my teacher later that day, and she told me that night, she said, your teacher will only talk to you from this point on if she has something nice to say to you. Because I told her, if you don't have something nice to say to my son, you may not speak to him. What happened next was also very telling. The rest of the year, she never spoke to me once. (laughs) Which, which, Which sent me a message, right? She had nothing to say to me. I remember the last day of the year, we went to her house in Dana Point, I lived down in Orange County for a beach party at her house. She was, had a beach house. And I thought that day she would say something, at least say goodbye to me or something to me. Didn't say a word the whole day. I don't know if she was afraid of my mom or I don't know if she didn't like me, but as a kid, that spoke volumes. You know what's interesting? I don't remember the name of my teacher. In fifth grade, sixth grade, seventh grade, eighth grade, ninth grade, or tenth grade. Any of my teachers. Blank. That's because I didn't go to school the rest of that time. I mean, I went. Every day. But I didn't go. I shut off. I actually read 
like the whole body of Heinlein's work and uh, Ray Bradbury. I read science fiction during class, but I was done. I just didn't care. That, that, that year in fourth grade created in me a, a bitterness, an anger, that the way that she had treated me and other people impacted me. But it didn't make me a kind person. It made me a bitter person. And I learned to use my words from that point on through my sophomore year of high school. I learned to use my words really well, very quickly. Always harshly, always cutting, always mean, just like I'd been treated. Because people who've been deeply hurt tend to deeply hurt, right? I don't know, I don't know what happened to her. I never will. I just know the impact it had on me. I know that by my, at the end of my sophomore year of high school, I had a 0.75. My mom was a math and science teacher. I said, I said, well, that's kind of a, I told her that's a low D. And she said, it's a high F. Um, and my parents were always encouraging, always kind. I don't think they fully understood what happened that year. But, but for the next seven years of my life, um, I was angry and bitter and mean to other people and self-centered. It was in the summer after my sophomore year of high school where everything changed because the story, the narrative that I had been told and that, I, that had been you know, spoken to me, they, I mean, you think about a school teacher has influence for you know, five, six, seven hours a day, five days a week on a child. Those of you that are school teachers, God's blessings on you. But remember the impact you have. It's not just educational, right? You're, you're speaking messages to kids. But, but, but you know, it was the next seven years later, that, and I'll tell you that story in a moment, but where everything changed again. And I started on a trajectory of going from bitterness to becoming a person who could be like the person of Jesus. I grew up in a home with no faith, no Jesus, no Bible. And so this is, what I was, this is the message I was sent. I seemed to buy into it, and that impacted the next seven years of my life. The way it was, there's unwholesome, unhelpful, damaging, and thoughtless words that we can speak, and they have impact. Ephesians 4.29 says this, Do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. Man, there's a lot there. There's a lot there. But the key thing I want you to notice is do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths. Unwholesome talk, unwholesome jokes, unwholesome, unwholesome comments, unwholesome language. It matters. Our words reflect what's in our soul. Do you ever slow down and just listen to yourself? Do you think before you speak and say, how am I going to say this? Is this wholesome or unwholesome? Does this build people up? Does this encourage people or does it harm them? Do I just fill time with kind of babbling and talking or tearing down? Do my words actually meet the needs of the people around me and, and bring blessing to them? Do they offer benefit to the people around me? Our words have power. And for many, many people, when you've been hurt by the words of others, and we all have moments where that happens, that can get a hold of our soul and then cause something to grow inside of us that damages others the way that we've been damaged. The way it was. The words break the heart of God. There are words that are spoken in this world that break the heart of God. I believe that when I was a fourth grader and I walked through that experience, I believe that broke the heart of God. I believe that God's heart breaks when children are hurt by people who have also been hurt along the way and aren't thinking about what they're doing. But there's a cost to that. Ephesians 4.30 says this, And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God with whom you were, are seal, were sealed for the day of redemption. I love that picture. That, that our, our, we can do things and say things that grieve the heart of God. But it says, Do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God with whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. In the ancient world, if somebody was to write a letter, and parchment was very expensive, it wasn't real common, but if somebody wrote a letter, to close it, they would put some melted wax and they would have a seal, either a ring or a signet they would take and press down and close that letter. They, they would be see, it would seal that letter. Well, this is saying that the Holy Spirit of God, if you, if you become a Christian, if you're a Christian now or if you become a Christian, you come to the cross, you confess your sins, you receive the love and the grace of Jesus, you allow him to be the leader of your life and you walk with him the rest of your life. When that happens, the Spirit of God places a seal on you and marks you and says, this one belongs to me. This one belongs to our God, to the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. But that Holy Spirit who lives in you when you become a Christian, who seals you and marks you, can be grieved we can grieve the heart of God. Other people can grieve the heart of God because God loves us more than we recognize and more than we realize. So we're warned to watch out for that. The way it was, words that rage smolder and fight. 
You know, in, in old Westerns, I mean, you know, them are fighting words. You know, it's going to, you know, you know, them are fighting. That's, it's going to lead to a showdown. It's going to lead to a shootout. It's going to lead to some, some kind of climax. Those, yeah, th- those words aren't just fight. They're words that create this conflict. Well, sometimes if we're not careful, our words become fighting words. The things we say can create damage between people. And so Ephesians 4.31 says, get rid of all bitterness, rage, and anger, brawling, and slander, along with every form of malice. I mean, that's a lot of different words. And if you do a word study on each of those words, you find that each one of them has a subtle difference, has a different meaning. The first one, bitterness. It's long-standing resentment and refusal to seek restoration. It's that, that growing resentment. And, you know, there's a chance to heal. Oh, no, 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 I'm not getting this thing healed. No chance. I'm holding this one against you. We begin to nurse that. The word rage is, is defined as outbursts of passionate anger and rage that flame up like fire and straw, and then burn out quickly. It, this is the person who, when something happens, they blow up, they explode. And then 10 minutes later, they're, like, they're fine. But everyone around them is still, whoa. Because, because that, this rage just explodes and then dissipates. But it costs something when that happens. The word anger here is kind of long-lived, habitual anger. Anger that continues and continues and continues. Brawling words, loud Yelling, screaming kinds of words. Slander, harsh and judgmental words. Malice, words that tear others down. All of these are are different ways of saying, be careful. Watch out for what comes out out of your mouth or off your thumbs when you're texting or when you're typing. Be careful. Because those words can grieve the heart of God because those words can create incredible damage. You have, you have a chance to influence people. And in and, and, and all of this, you know, God is saying to us, walk away from bitterness and all that, and all that rages up out of that. That can, can be rotting your soul and shaping you and walk into compassion. Become a different kind of person. A person who reflects the heart of Jesus. And at this moment in a sermon, what I could do is I could say, now let me give you five steps to compassion. Here's your five steps. Do this, do this, 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 and you'll show that you're a compassionate person. But here's the problem. If something doesn't change inside of us, we try to act compassionate instead of acting bitter. We try to act kind instead of acting angry, but we are bitter, we are angry, and we haven't dealt with it. Then we can act a certain way, but it's going to be this back and forth of blowing up and subtle things and, and, you know, and then acting a certain way. I'm not going to walk you through five ways to fix this thing. I want to talk about a deeper level of things. And that is, what is it that begins to change our hearts from bitterness to compassion? What is it that begins to transform us and set us on a journey of transformation? For some of you, after we talk about this, you might say, I still need to, I want to meet with someone and talk about how do I address some of the anger, some of the explosive things. We've got lay counselors here. We've got Christian counselors. We've got pastors you can meet with. We can talk about those things and dig into that. But I want to look really at what happens within our souls and how that can transform, start a process of transforming us into the dream life, who we want to be and who we really should be. And so for me, after fourth grade, fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth, ninth, tenth grade, um, I was marked by that year. I probably didn't recognize it at the time. I probably don't fully recognize it now. But that, that year, those nine months of being in that environment day after day after day for you know, hours and hours a day had a huge impact on me. And then in the summer after my sophomore year of high school, God began to show up in my life. I had no sense of who God was. I never touched a Bible, read a Bible. I'd never, I just didn't have any connection with spiritual things. And my sister Gretchen, who's one year older than me, my sister Gretchen met Jesus. She became a follower of Jesus. And my sister Gretchen and I fought constantly. She stopped fighting with me. She just stopped. I didn't know what to do. Because we, had this, we knew how the relationship worked. And she started to not only show me the love of God, she began to speak to me the love of God. And I would just retaliate back. And she wouldn't fight back. She just kept showing me the love of God and speaking the love of God. And God used her to begin to break into my, what, what looked like a really hard soul. Uh, this, this Wednesday night, just a couple days from now, at our night of worship, we're going to be focusing on the, the parable of the sower, scattering the seed. And, and that story in the Bible that we'll look at Wednesday talks about the sower that sows seed, and some is on rocky soil, and some is on weedy soil, and some is on a path, and some is on good soil. And only the, 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 the seed on the good soil really multiplies and grows. If you would have looked at me at, my, at that point in my life, at almost 16 years old, you would have said, weedy, hard, rocky, path, soil, don't throw any seed over there. But my sister Gretchen did. 
And what nobody knew, including me, is that my heart was actually soft soil. And I was longing for truth and longing for God and longing for more. My bitterness and my rage and my anger at everyone around me and my sharp words and my pushing people away. Um, I don't want to live that life. That wasn't the dream life. Nobody dreams of that. And then along comes a guy named Doug, this college student, who was part of the youth group that she went to. And he began, began to show me the service of Jesus and he would begin telling me about the good news of Jesus, that God loved me. Jesus came to this world. He died on the cross. He rose again. I hadn't, even, I hadn't heard those things. I didn't know that Christmas was about Jesus. I didn't know that Easter was about Jesus. I didn't know anything. And Doug began to tell me the story of Jesus. And he scattered some seed in my life. And then this youth pastor, Dan, not only taught the Bible to the, the students at the youth group at Garden Grove Community Church, he not only taught the Bible, but he began to let me know that he saw things in me before I was a Christian. He said, I see leadership in you. People had called me a ringleader before, uh, but they hadn't called me a leader, right? Uh, and, and he began to point things out that he saw in me that God eventually birthed in me and used for his glory. And so in that summer, between sophomore, my sophomore and junior year of high school, the story that I had been told, the things I had been told about myself, the, the way I had been valued by this teacher and that whole year that had kind of shaped the next seven years of my life, God began to dismantle that and tear that apart. And through my sister Gretchen, God began to show his love to me. And through Doug, God began to show, tell me the story of Jesus through Doug. And Doug told me about his faith. He was a new believer himself. He had no training, no Bible school. He was just a new Christian. And he told me what God did in his life. But I understood it and I believed it. And then the youth pastor began to speak into my life. And that began to bring transformation. And then when I put my faith in Jesus, listen closely. When I put my faith in Jesus, it didn't mean that at that moment I became a Christian, boom, all my bitterness was gone and my, and my, and my sharp tongue was healed and my, my selfishness was gone and I was just this incredibly mature, almost 16-year-old young Christian and, and I just was compassionate and loving and kind. Praise the Lord, story's over. No. What happened is God began me on a journey of walking, of letting, of, you know, out with the old, out with the bitterness, out with the sharp tongue, out with the mean-spiritedness, out with the selfishness, and in with compassion and love and forgiveness, forgiving like Christ forgave me, and love like Christ had loved me. It was the presence of Jesus. And it's funny, my dad, until he became a Christian, he never understood. He would say to me, he'd say, Kevin, remember that after your sophomore year of high school, you made those new friends and how that changed you. I'd say every time, Dad, my new friends didn't change me. Jesus changed me. But my parents saw it right away. I knew that, it, it's, and can I tell you right now, if you say, oh, so no, Kevin, here, isn't it great? Now you're perfectly compassionate and tender and caring all the time. Check in with my wife on that one sometimes. I'm, wor I'm working really hard at it. I'm, lear I'm learning, I'm growing. But it's a journey, and, and that, that's the journey of out with the old and in with the, out with bitterness and anger and rage and whatever's caused that, and through the power of Christ, through the grace of Jesus, through the healing of his Holy Spirit, through his presence in us, through his forgiveness, we learn to forgive others. Through his love, we learn to love others, and we begin to live as new people. And it's a journey. And for some people, you're going to need some help along the way with that journey. Talk to us. Talk to the pastors at the church and we'll connect you with people that can walk with you. If you say, boy, I've got some stuff that's built up in me. I, don't, I want to be out with that and done with that. I've received Jesus, but now I'm struggling there. We want to walk with you. We want to go deeper with you. But today, what I want to focus on is just the reality that when we come to Jesus, when we receive his grace, when we walk with him, we start to walk into the way it could be. The way it could be. Our words can be thoughtful and bring blessing. We can grow, grow compassionate with our words. Ephesians 4, 29 and 32 says this. Do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only what's helpful for building others up according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. But verse 32 says this, be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as in Christ God forgave you. Become a new person. When, when you start to walk away from bitterness and anger, and you start to actually... Not like pretend you're compassionate, but feel for people to actually have compassion and care about them and act on that. God delights in that. And you know what we discover? That's the dream life. 
When, when you go from bitterness and rage and anger and jealousy to compassion and caring and loving people and forgiving them, understand that God forgave you for everything. How can I not forgive them? That transforms your heart. It transforms your life. It's not just kind of behavioral modification. It's heart change. And that's what Jesus does as he enters in. And he shows us how to, to, to listen to people, to care for people, to build them up with our words, to think, well, well the things I'm going to say meet their needs, or the things I'm going to do show the presence and the love of Jesus. Is this... Is this fitting for them, and we're thinking about other people in a whole new way, the way it could be. Our words can lift, restore, and heal. Our words can show the presence of Jesus. Listen to this passage again, verses 29 and 32. If you're in your own Bibles, we're going to read 29 and 32. Do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only what's helpful. Is this going to help? For building others up, will this strengthen them, uplift them, according to their needs, that means I have to know their needs and care about their needs. That it may benefit those who listen. That means there's a lot of thought that goes into everything I say. I don't just bleh everything out there. But I stop and I think, will this benefit them? Will this build them up? Does this meet their needs? And be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other just as God and Christ forgave you. And then he goes on to talk about loving others as Christ has loved you. That's the invitation of the Apostle Paul to the Ephesian church. A life that was filled with bitterness and anger and rage and all that, that leads to kind of corroding our soul. To growing to become somebody who actually loves and forgives and has compassion and understands other people enough to be able to speak to them in a way that builds them up. That's a whole different life. I will tell you as a pastor, I'm on that journey. I'm learning to become more the person God wants me to be. Can I tell you a little secret? Every step I take closer to that, I take a deeper step into God's dream life for me. There's nothing like it. There's nothing like it. And, and, and what happens in our lives, in your life, as you follow Jesus and walk in his ways and address the, where the bitterness came from and deal with those things and then walk in the ways of Jesus and try to love like he loves and forgive and see people with his eyes. You don't just do things differently, you see the world differently. And the satisfaction and the joy and the meaning that comes from that is better than anything this world has to offer. The enemy comes to steal, kill, and destroy. Jesus came that you may have life and have it to the full. He's the one that can take us from bitterness to compassion and forgiveness and love. Lord Jesus, this is our prayer that out of this conversation today, out of thinking together about your word today in Ephesians 4 and the beginning of Ephesians chapter 5, our prayer is that those gathered today online or on campus who are listening and who say, man, I need to tackle this. I need to, I need to think deeply about this. I, I think there's bitterness still rooted in my soul that's coming out and affecting all of my life. I pray they would have the courage to come to you with it, Jesus, but also the courage to come to a pastor, to reach out to a pastor and say, can you connect me with someone who can help me walk through whatever it takes to address this. I'm going to ask that we have quiet our hearts together and just to take a moment in God's presence. And would you just take a moment and say, God, help me recognize those places where bitterness was birthed in my soul. Those experiences with a sibling, with a neighbor, with a family member, with a, with a parent. Those moments with a boss or a friend that were so deeply painful that the enemy took that moment and just tried to root bitterness in my soul. Would you just pray that God could show you those moments and that you could bring them to the throne of Jesus? If you're a follower of Jesus, that you could say, Jesus, I offer this to you. And I pray, oh Jesus, that you will give me the power and strength to walk and leave that behind me. And, and if I need to get help, to get the help I need to really address these things and leave them behind me. And then walk in your forgiveness, so Jesus, in your love, in your compassion. Jesus, that I just wouldn't act compassionate and act caring, but Lord, that I would be caring and be compassionate, just like Jesus, you are towards me and every person. Would you ask Jesus to grow your heart with the love that he loved you with? To strengthen you to be able to forgive as God in Jesus Christ forgave you if you're a Christian. And if you're not yet a follower of Jesus, we always have many people at Shoreline online and on campus that are trying to figure out who Jesus is, but you've not come to the cross and received him. Would you know that if today or any day 
you want to reach out to one of the pastors and say, can I talk about what it means to follow Jesus? I want to learn more. Maybe you feel like you're not ready to take that step, but you want to learn about it. We would love to meet with you. We would love to talk with you. If you say, I want to receive Jesus, we'd love to pray with you to see your life transformed. Jesus, this is our prayer today. That you who can take a thief and make them a generous servant to those in need. In need. You, you who can take words that are, that are bitter and angry and make them kind and thoughtful. You are the one that can change our lives. You can take a heart that has been broken, that's been filled with bitterness. And in Jesus, in your power, you can write a new story. You can give a new vision. You can speak the truth. And where the enemy has sought to steal, kill, and destroy, Jesus, will you bring life and bring it to the fall? We pray, Jesus, in your name and for your glory. Amen. Before I invite you to stand and send you off with a word of blessing, uh, I want to give you a couple of quick invitations. First of all, when you're done, if you're on campus here, before you leave out in the courtyard, there's some tables that have like ice cream cones all over them, and the, the pictures of them. That's where you'll get your ice cream Sunday. So if you want to get a Sunday before you leave, get one. And then hang out, talk and visit with somebody, meet somebody new and have a conversation. Uh, this Wednesday, just a couple days from today, is our night of worship. We usually begin at 6.15. We're starting at 5.15 with a free barbecue. Please come and join us and be, have dinner with us and share that time together. Then at 6.30, we'll have our adult programs and also all the kids' programs and special stuff for the kids. It's going to be a blast. So be here this Wednesday, 5.15. If you need prayer for anything at all, if there's a joy or a need, or maybe you say, man, there's some stuff in my soul that I want to have someone pray for me for, we'd love to do that. If you're on campus here, just come in the worship center. Both sides of the stage, there'll be teams there ready to pray for you. If you're online, just call the number you see there, or if you want to email the address you see with your prayer needs, we commit to pray for you over the coming weeks. And if you are uh, on campus and you're new, we want to give you a warm personal welcome. We're glad you're here. And so you can go to the Connection Center right there just inside the lobby, and they want to give you a little gift bag and answer your questions and give you a warm personal welcome. If you're online and you're new, we welcome you personally. But if you'll just text the word welcome to the number you see on your screen, we want to get to know you personally and reach out to you. So we'll follow up if you'll just text us and let us know you're there. We want to connect with you wherever you are in the world. We want to reach out to you and connect with you. Uh, wherever you are, online or on campus, will you stand with me and give me the honor of sending you off with a word of blessing? As we finish this time together, may you walk in the presence of the living God who knows your story. He knows where the enemy has tried to steal and kill and destroy, and it grieves his heart. But as you draw near to him, you'll recognize that he has come to give you life and life to the full. Grow in that life. Walk in that life. Be so filled with the presence of Jesus it overflows wherever you go. God bless you. Have a great day and we'll see you Wednesday night at 5.15 for our barbecue right here in the courtyard. Blessings. Have a great day.